Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our webinar today. My name is Gerald Green. I'm here with our other advisor, Taylor Stewart. And uh, tonight we're going to talk to you about our smart retirement tax planning um, and just overall investment look. You know, some of some of the things we look at as investment advisors with uh, con what seems like constant legislative changes and, and or market. executive orders. No. This depends on what you're looking <laughs> or at. Or executive orders, exactly. So we want to make sure that uh, regardless of if you're working with uh, an investment professional now or just looking to get some questions answered, we try to give you uh, a perspective from looking at all kinds of different angles. Now, you will see here in the uh, chat bar, there should be an offer showing up here that if as we go through this, if you'd like to schedule time to talk about something we talk about tonight or have some other questions, you'll be able to uh, click on that inside that chat function and uh, schedule a 15 minute call with either myself or Taylor. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have um, uh, either about this topics, the, the topics we'll cover tonight or something else that may be on your horizon. Uh, these are standard disclosure, uh, disclosures here. Uh, let you know that uh, we are an investment advisory services and we are an SEC registered investment advisor. So we are going to start here. Where are we going to cover in this presentation? Um, so what's changed in the tax world? What's still important to us now, knowing that a lot of these tax rules are going to change in the oncoming years and maybe sooner? Uh, and what does this all mean for you now? What does it mean for you in retirement? And how can we kind of meld those two things together? So the first here, the first slide here talks about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Uh, that was passed uh, previously with the previous administration. Now, it went through what's called reconciliation, so it didn't need the typical two-thirds majority. It went through both uh, the House and the Senate, and what it said is it can't cost more than $1.5 over 10 years, no cost after 10 years, and here's the big thing. All the changes that were made in this Tax Cuts and job, Jobs Act are going to sunset, and most of them are going to sunset at the end of 2025. So a lot of these, uh, these tax changes that you can take advantage of now are going to be gone in 2025. We don't know if they're going to continue them, if they're just gonna revert back to what they were back in 2017. Uh, there's a lot of different options, but right now we know as far as the current law is, these are good till 2025, but as we know, things can change on a dime. Like the national debt, right? That's that's a big uh, ticking, you know, ticking clock there that may change these tax brackets before 2025. We might have to, you know, pass some tax laws and adjust the tax brackets. Uh, you know, we we've got this national debt that continues to climb, um, so we want to make sure that we're we're doing what we can now, knowing that at least in 2025 it will change, but possibly sooner. So the big thing is it sets up winners and losers. So what do we mean by that? So as an individual, we saw a tax and overall tax rate reduction and the alternative minimum tax reduction. We saw the estate tax coupon double and it raised revenue, but still a total revenue loss for the government uh, of just under $1.5 trillion. Businesses, again, we saw some rate reductions in that corporate tax structure all of that's good for the corporate tax. It, it increases spending, it increases hiring, and, and through normal business cycles, these are all good things. It's when you add these extraordinary events like a pandemic that really can uh, move things around, move the needle, and, and makes us take a longer, harder look at what is going on. So let's take a look at the tax bracket. So on the left side, the previous law, we're looking 2017 and before, you can see uh, the 33% tax bracket there starting at 233,000 up to 416 with the standard deduction of 12,700 plus a personal exemption. On the right side, the current law, the current structure that again sunsets in 2025, um, you can see that same overlap in income. So from 172, to 329,000 is in the 24%. Whereas if you're in the top of the 24%, you were in the middle of the 33% bracket under the prior law. So a 9% swing in tax changes there. Um, and then the standard deduction of 25,100, eliminating that personal exemption. 
So other changes, like Taylor touched on, that standard deduction increase. So we used to have be able to itemize this, whether it was health expenses or charitable organizations, things like that that we're in touch on here. But now a lot of those deductions were done away with. And the current law says, here's your standard deduction and what we have to go through in order to, um, hold on, I apologize folks that were saying there's, noting that there's nothing shared here. So I do apologize. Our computer is showing okay here. Give me one second. I love technology. Right? Yeah, technology is a great thing. So let's get back to that slide here. You should be able to see that screen if you couldn't before. Um, but again, let us know in the chat. Uh, but again, the standard deduction increased uh, up to that 25,000 increase the alternative minimum tax exemption, but that mortgage interest deduction reduced below. Excellent. Now we're getting feedback. That All, people right, can see. All right. We're very on board good. here. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Uh, but that mortgage interest deduction was reduced to, uh, 750,000. So here's some other changes that, that were made. Uh, double the uh, state tax exclusion to $11.7 million per person or 23.4 for the couple. Elimination of the Affordable Care Act individual mandate and penalty. Repeal of miscellaneous itemized deductions uh, for investment fees and other expenses that again, were kind of lumped in with the overall standard deduction. And then with the 529 plans, it allows for tax favored distributions for elementary and secondary expenses up to $10,000 per student on an annual basis. So this the, the tax cut changes really opened the doors for, yes, we saw the elimination of a lot of deductions, but it opened the doors for a lot of more, a lot more options, especially if you're saving for college, if you, you were nearing that estate tax uh, coupon amount previously, which was half of the $11.7 million. So there were uh, some very beneficial things in this tax cuts that uh, as of right now are still there. So now the charitable deductions is, is a common topic that we come up with when we're meeting with clients is, you know, you, some may not have these de deductions exceeding that standard deduction, uh, but you can make multiple years contributions in one time. So one of the key things that have come from this Tax Cuts and Job Act is what's called a donor advised fund. So you can just put money into this and it's distributed over time. So these charitable organizations are getting not only your initial charitable contribution, but they're getting growth uh, also distributed to them. So it's a win-win, not only for you, but for the charitable organization. And one thing I can think of off the top meeting with clients that do have these donor advised funds is there's a lot of confusion. Well, can it hold securities? Can it hold just cash? What does that look like? It can hold securities. And what we've seen and strategized with some people is you know, we're going to donate X amount of dollars per year for this set amount of time. Let's take some of these stocks that maybe we've had for a long time that have large capital gains or something like that and pass that on because that's not taxed to these charitable, uh, to these charitable organizations. So now here it does say age 70 and a half and up can take qualified charitable distributions. That's actually been changed to 72 with the delay of your required minimum distributions. But what we're talking about here is just those that normal tithing or normal charitable contributions that you want to make before you could deduct that above the line on your income taxes. Right now, the way it's written, there's a, there's more hoops to jump through. But if you are over 72 and you have an IRA and you have to take that required minimum distribution, uh, but really it's just adding to your income plan. It's not something generally that you're relying on for your normal annual income then what we've helped clients do is actually use that in order to give to that charitable contribution. And what it does is it saves the client's tax. Because if you have a $10,000 distribution that you need to take from your IRA, you can satisfy that by sending it to a charity where they're getting the full required minimum distribution, but you do not have to pay taxes on that money that is sent to that charitable organization. So you're satisfying your required minimum distribution that you would regardless have to take,
but now you're not paying taxes on, say, that $10,000. And an important thing there, too, is neither are those charitable uh, organizations as they receive those dollars. So it's really passing those taxes on, um, but not to those charitable organizations. So they can use and leverage those dollars and not have to pay the taxes on it as well. So above the line, what's an above the line contribution for, for starters? So uh, looking at IRA contributions, if you put $6,000 in per individual or $7,000 per individual over 50, that six or $7,000 will come directly dollar for dollar off of your, um, your income for the year. Same with the HSA contributions, 3,600 for individuals, 7,200 for families plus an extra thousand if you're 55 years or older, and then half of your self-employment um, deductions for Social Security and Medicare as well. One thing I'd like to touch on here real quick is these HSA contributions. Um, historically, this is one of the most underutilized tax advantage plans that are available to clients, especially those clients that want to retire early. One of the first questions I ask is, how are we paying for health care? So having this HSA and trying to maximize those contributions, not only is going to save you taxes, but it's going to allow you a, a position to put less stress on your overall retirement plan later on in life if you get into medical expenses that are unplanned uh, or, or just out of the ordinary. As we grow older, obviously, the medical expenses tend to go up. So we or want to you're having kids as well. I yeah, mean, yeah. Oh, younger kids, breaking bones, all of those things. We want to make sure that we have another bucket that's tax deferred, or if you use it for those medical expenses, you're not paying taxes on that. Above the line, another above the line uh, deduction, those student loan interest. It was $2,500 per year. Now it's phased out if you're single and making between 65 and 80,000 or for married couples, 135 to 165,000. Uh, alimony, that's one that kind of changed. It's only deductible if that alimony decree was ordered before December 31st, 2018. Now, if it was afterwards, then that is no longer an above the line deduction. Early withdrawal penalties uh, are also above the line. So if you have to take money out of a retirement plan early uh, due to an unforeseen circumstance, that usually 10% federal tax penalty is a deduction. And then there are some limited business expenses uh, that you can deduct. Uh, of course, our school teachers, it says $250. I'd really love that to see like $25,000 <laughs> because uh, the, the teachers are definitely uh, uh, underfunded in that department. Uh, Army Reserves is traveling over 1,000 miles and expenses to allow disabled persons to work. So let's talk about the SECURE Act. So setting up every community up for retirement enhancement act. It was passed in December of 2019, became law January of 2020. It's the biggest retirement legislation that we've seen in a decade. Um, and it includes a variety of changes ranging from what's available in your 401k to withdrawal changes, as well as eliminating the one of the big ones is the elimination of the stretch IRA. So if you were to pass assets on to your children, typically they could take that over their lifetime. Now it eliminates that and you have to take it within that 10 year period. It also changed the RMD age or required minimum distribution age from 70 and a half to 72. And I have seen that there's been some talk about changing that to even 75 because you know folks are living a longer lifetime. Now, the pandemic and taxes, the CARES Act that we saw passed last year and those economic stimulus payments. So uh, the stimulus payments are not taxable. It's not considered taxable income. So as of right now, we don't have to worry about adding that and the government trying to take back some of that money. So that's a good thing. But it caused obviously a high unemployment, even to this date, as the numbers, the, the jobs numbers came out earlier today, we're still talking about 10 million people without a job who had a job almost a year ago, uh, which not only, of course, is lost tax revenue, but it's lost money going into the economy. So let's talk about the tax buckets. So in our world, there's there's four different buckets of money. We've got fully taxable income, which would be uh, pension income, short term gains, stock dividends. Uh, and then we have tax deferred. So you're putting money into your traditional IRA, your 401k all these years. 
uh, non-qualified annuities and savings bonds, you're putting that money in there and it's pre-tax, you're taking it out and it is now taxable event to you at ordinary income rate. Then we have long-term capital gains. So you think about your standard brokerage account. Maybe you have a joint account with a spouse or a trust owned account. Um, these assets are held outside of, outside of qualified accounts for more than 12 months and you have long-term capital gains. So as long as you're paying or you're holding that asset for longer than 366 days, it is a long-term capital gain, which in most instances are less than your ordinary income tax rate. And then the tax-free bucket, the Roth IRA, municipal bonds, life insurance, death benefit for life insurance, and a portion of your social security income. We're going to talk about how we can maximize and leverage these buckets now you know, maximizing the, the working income, putting that into the 401k, reducing taxes now. But then when we're getting closer to those retirement years or in retirement before we're forced to take our RMDs, looking at how do we get this money into, on the right side, that tax-free bucket. So again, having funds in all of these buckets is, is the best approach. And if you've only got one or two of them right now, don't sweat about your retirement. There's, there's ways to be able to start funding these through different means to set you up for retirement. It's never too late and it's never too early. The best approach is obviously have them all fully funded, but we know life is, is, is a journey. So uh, just because you may only have one or two of these right now, that's all right. It's about coming up with a plan that's looking to fill what you can of all of these buckets. And I would say it's more common than not, Gerald, and I don't know if you would agree with the tax deferred. I mean, we're working all of these years, we're contributing to these 401ks, or maybe you're a small business owner and you have a SEP or a simple um, that's the most common savings vehicle. So we're working, we're paying for kids, going through school. Maybe we don't have a whole lot of discretionary income that we can save outside of that. Well, let's start leveraging that once we're into retirement or nearing retirement to start making that plan for the future. So to touch on that a little bit, these are the, the, the problems with that tax deferred bucket. So like Taylor mentioned, every distribution is taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. So depending on where you're at in retirement, while well, you've got social security, maybe have a pension, and now you're taking money out of your 401k, maybe you're making as much in retirement as you were when you were working, which is a good goal. You wanna make sure you can continue that lifestyle in retirement. But as you age, your required minimum distributions are gonna go up, so your tax bracket may go up. Uh, dis uh, distributions often lead to additional tax on your social security income. So depending on what your total income is, that dictates how much of your social security is taxed. It could be, it could be zero, uh, 50% or 85% are those three basic buckets that your social security income gets taxed at. So having that income plan to know what your taxes are gonna be in retirement is key. We can't avoid taxes, uh, we'll end up somewhere in federal prison. <laughs> yeah. But with the proper plan, you absolutely can dictate what your tax bracket is in retirement. Distributions also can lead to more tax on capital gains. So once you get above a certain income limit, that capital gains rate that Taylor was talking about that is 15% ordinarily can jump up to 20 or even higher percentage. Only accounts uh, that require uh, distribution. So IRA, 401k, 403b, simple IRAs, SEP IRAs, once you reach that magical age of 72, you have those required minimum distributions. Again, regardless of if you need it or not, government says you have to take it so they can tax it. So having a plan around that additional income, especially if you're not taking money out from retirement up to age 72, is going to be key. And then the highest taxed accounts to leave to heirs. So you leave it to your beneficiaries. They're still working. They're in the workforce. They have their, maybe at their highest earning potential at that point. And now because they got rid of that stretch IRA, your qualified account is going to a non-spouse beneficiary and they have to take that money out within 10 years, which could throw them into a whole nother tax bracket. And that's a, that's a really important one. I think that we should touch back on too, is the highest tax account leaving it to the heirs. Since we got rid of the stretch IRA provision and now it's 10 years, if your if your kids are at that level where you know they're they're decently high income earners, they might have to take these funds out over the course of that ten years, bump them up a tax bracket. 
there's little tweaks that we can make wrong uh, along the way now for you that would be a tax benefit for you as well as a tax benefit for your heirs. A lot of times in meetings we'll hear, well, if I'm passing money on to the kids, I can't really be hurting them, right? Well, that may or may not be true depending on their situation. But as long as we can maximize this for you and maximize it for the kids and let that grow tax free, you're really adding, maybe not hurting those kids, but maximizing that benefit for the kids as well. And I do see, I want to pause here for a second. I know we are getting some questions through the chat and, and we'll try to answer all of them as, as best we can. But if we're unable to answer your question, uh, rest assured that we uh, we will answer that. All you would have to do is hit that schedule a 15 minute call and we'll be able to, to uh, get that question answered for you. Uh, and in today's presentation, we're really talking from a, a, a general uh, situation. Obviously, every plan that we come up with as advisors is unique to uh, our clients' goals. Uh, trying to speak in, in generalities and, and spark that conversation, but um, really to give you that specific advice that comes through to having that conversation with you on a one-off basis to make sure that we do understand your current actual situation and are giving you the best advice. So the IRA exit strategy. So with this, um, and I know Taylor loves this topic, this is about taking money from your IRA and getting it over into your Roth IRA. Yeah, and so uh, there's a there's a lot of benefits to this. So let's say we're nearing retirement. Uh, you know, we're going to start converting these dollars. We know that the current uh, the current tax brackets will sunset in 2025, maybe sooner. So we want to start acting now. Let's pay some of the tax on these IRAs as long as we're not we're not going to harm you or bump you up a tax bracket. Convert it to the Roth IRA. Now let's say we're retired and we've got a balance of 50 50, and we start Social Security. Well, if we're taking all of our money from the IRA to fulfill our income. We may just be paying more on Social Security, more tax on Social Security than what's actually needed. So we can continue to convert more of these dollars from the IRA to the Roth IRA pre-Social Security. That's another great strategy. So what we're doing is taking money from the left, paying the taxes on it, and put the money into the right. That money will now grow tax-free for the rest of your life as you take distributions and income out of this account it's not going to show up on your uh, your income tax as a qualified distribution, therefore not making a larger portion of your social security potentially taxable. Right, and we do work with CPAs and specific tax planners because again, we, we are a lot of things, we wear a lot of hats here at Madsen Financial, but I am not a CPA, Taylor is not a CPA. We understand Nor how- Nor do the, I wanna be <laughs> one, <laughs> especially today. <laughs> we have, we understand how the taxes work in that retirement planning, but we run through, we have preferred partners that we run these tax plans through, or if you have your own specific CPA that you work with, um, to make sure that this does make sense for your specific situation. And again, once you start adding on the social security, what your, your uh, current qualified accounts look like, there's several different ways to, to sum this up but you just wanna make sure that it fits what you're looking to do, not only from a needs based in retirement, but a lifestyle base while paying Uncle Sam as little as possible. So the advantages of a Roth conversion, future income is received tax-free after five, five years. Now you can still have access to the, the principal that you've put in, but you cannot receive any of that growth until that five year window has passed. Otherwise we'll be subject to penalties. Larger sums of money can be accessed in the case of emergencies such as long-term care without significantly raising tax brackets if you're over 59 and a half. This is a good one. If somebody goes into care at a younger age than we had planned on and we have to take these funds out, we want to make sure that we're not raising that tax bracket or, or recognizing any of these penalties to pay for that care. So it's a good strategy to use while we're at a younger age as well. Um, we're not saying that, you know, it's not right to just have everything in a, in a Roth IRA, everything in a qualified. There is a good balance that we want to have. So with all this tax talk, let's kind of put the, the numbers there and show an example. So we have a married couple, both age 65. And in 2017, they were at the top of the 15% tax bracket. Now, their goal is to convert 200000 of the IRA to a Roth IRA. So what does that mean in you know dollars 
uh, dollars to donuts, I guess, as they say. <laughs> so an ex- example of 2017, if they do it, if they did it, about $56,000 of it uh, in tax. After this Tax Cup and Jobs Act uh, law, the conversion in that same tax bracket only cost them 44000 So that's over 20% savings. So that's more money that's working in your Roth. Uh, it's more money staying in your pocket and less going to Uncle Sam. So again, having that specific plan on the timing of it and how it wraps around your income plan is, is key. Having that written income plan, which again, we'll touch on in a little bit. So let, let's talk about how we can apply all of this to our plans now and moving forward. Um, and the very first principle here that we're going to talk about is number one, don't run out of money. Uh, we always say on and on and on the retirement isn't about how much money you have. It's about how much income you have. We don't want to run out of that money and make sure that we're maximizing those assets. And a big part of that is taxes. So, the one of the easiest ways to run out of money is not having that written income plan. Have it on paper. Does it mean it's set in stone or we're writing it on the stone tablet? No, we understand life happens. There's changes in life. There's changes in laws. So thing uh, having one plan one day, it may have to change, but it's got to be adaptable. This shows an example here of someone who has an investment amount of a million dollars, wants to retire and draw $5,000 out at retirement per month. But because they're not really looking at that written income plan, taking into consideration not only their taxes, but their social security, their required minimum distributions, what it means in order to make this successful doing it that way is they only have a 19% chance of probability that they'll, they'll la- their money will last. Really, they need $1.5 million to do that. Otherwise, they're going to have to retire later or they're going to have to withdraw a smaller amount. But with just some simple planning through the tax benefit savings, through the reduction of the overall taxes you're having, along with Social Security optimization, now we're looking at the same type of plan, having that $5,000 withdrawal, starting with a million dollars, Really, it's a difference of they need an additional $39,000 over the course of the next two years to have that retirement that they want of that $5,000 income. When you're talking about income in retirement, you should also be talking with your advisor about what taxes look like and and how those conversions, excuse me, from an IRA to a Roth IRA could really benefit you. So another one is protection against valid tax volatility. We got to take a look at location as well as allocation. So where are these dollars parked and how are they invested and not, uh, you know, so much why they're invested, but how they're invested and how is that going to benefit you? Now we're also going to look at maintaining the tax buckets and diversifying, not just by asset or asset class, but the qualifications of these dollars and those income sources. So taxable, tax deferred and tax tax free. Um, taxes down, take from tax deferred IRAs and taxes up, realizing long-term gains from taxable. One thing that would be a major uh, you know, change in the overall tax law that we, we may see come down the pipeline at some point is an increase in long-term capital gains from 15 to, there's talk 30, 40, north of 40, um, 15 and 20 right now to again, 30, 40% and uh, losing that step up in cost basis, which is a a big benefit to your heirs at this point as well. So the big key takeaway here is we know what taxes are today. We don't know what taxes are going to be, you know, two years from now, three years. I mean, things can change that quick. So having a a diversified approach um, will really serve you in the long run, because I, I, I know people laugh at me when I say this, but taxes could go down based on your income. I mean, it's possible. Yeah, you know, it, it's possible. Is is it probable? Yeah, I, I don't know. I have my crystal ball works as well as the next guys. But again, having different buckets, not knowing what's going to happen. The whole key here is to keep as much of your money in your pocket. Guiding principle number two is don't lose your money. That's a lot of times easier said than done. But what that means is by having that diversified approach, and here we're taking a look at the S&P 500 going all the way back to 1999 through, and this slide is through April of last year, and it shows it closed at 3,600, and now it's 
it closed today at over 3,900. So there's going to be ups and downs in the market. Uh, are we going to see another 10 years going forward that we've seen the last 10 years? I, I don't know. It was a pretty good run in the market. So having that diversification and being able to adapt with ch ever changing markets, which is what that future is going to hold, is really going to be key. Do you have a buying opportunity if the market goes down or is your advisor just saying, hold on, it'll come back? That's, I mean, that's kind of what we hear from a lot of clients who come in the door the first time. But what you want to do is be in a position to take advantage of that market on that downswing. You want to buy low and sell high. The only way you can do that is have that written plan and, and have some good diversification. And a lot of times we see people come through the doors and, and, you know, they've heard that same thing from their, you know, from their advisor, hold on, it'll come back, hold on, it'll come back. That's not advice, right? That's just saying, if we don't have a diversified plan, my hands are tied, we have nowhere else to go. So hold on, and it will come back. Yeah. And that can add maximum stress to not only you emotionally, but uh, as well as your overall portfolio and your income. So think about it, if we have an IRA or a qualified account, the markets go down 20% and we're taking out, you know, three, 4% withdrawal um, rate off of our portfolio. And then you tack on 22% tax bracket on top of that. Now we're really realizing a 40% decrease in our dollar for dollar to take that same income out that we would have been taking before the downturn in that market. So it's very important to have that proper diversification as well as the different buckets of money. And finally, guiding principle number three, don't waste your money. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean don't buy what you want, but have a plan around things. Unless you're Congress. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Uh, one example, though, where uh, falling or, uh, planning falls short is with that long-term nursing care situation. You never know if you're going to need long-term care. Uh, I mean, again, your crystal ball works as well as mine. So having a plan for what that cost is. I mean, the average nursing home cost right now, $8,700 a month for that full-time um, uh, facility. And if the average inflation that we've seen through the last years of four and a half percent, that means that same care 15 years from now is going to be about $16,000 a month. It's going to double in 15 years. About the time you're, you're maybe you're 60 now and you're going to retire in a couple of years, get to 75, God forbid you need nursing home care, but there's different ways to plan around this. Again, you don't want to add stress to that retirement income. So having a plan around what that <clears throat> nursing home situation looks like, uh, usually the best case is let's plan to cover that in home, you know, have that care provided in home. And you're seeing a lot of insurance companies really start switching to that model because in yep, care. it's more cost effective, not only for the insurance carriers, but also for the clients themselves. And generally speaking, they live longer when you're staying in the home that you're familiar with, that you know, and it, it's a better quality of life. So again, not saying long-term care insurance is needed, but having a plan around should that need arise, how are you going to uh, provide for your own care? And making sure that you're using the proper long-term care type of policy for you and your unique needs, whether that's a, a monthly premium type plan or it's a, a whole life type uh, kind of hybrid and in life insurance policy that provides that care. Um, I, I can think of a client right off the top and we've had conversations the last couple of years that keep getting these premium increase notices in the mail. The last one we saw was a 200% increase in premiums mm -hmm. or we're cutting the benefit by a large amount it's becoming less and less affordable for these clients. The, the cost of that care is becoming less and less affordable. The, the price of what that care is gonna cover is becoming less and less. And then you factor in the average inflation of the long-term care services, it just flat out doesn't make any sense in some instances. I'm not saying that's maybe your scenario or the next person's scenario, but it's a reality that we need to look at. And there's a lot of different ways to structure that. So again, that's a, it's a very important topic that we want to make sure that we cover. Um, but number one is if we put some sort of insurance uh, in place, it needs to be affordable, but not, not just now, later on. So we want to have a premium that we can, you know, it's, it's a smaller pill to swallow and something we can plan for in the future. And that covers our, our, our tax strategy planning tonight. I appreciate everyone who uh, uh, took time out of their evening to spend it with us. Please, if you have 
questions and uh, would like to follow up with either myself or Taylor, go ahead and schedule that 15 minute call. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have and really talk about your specific scenario and how we can help. Uh, regardless of where you're at, there's no question too big or too small. We'd love to address it uh, with you and see if we can uh, help you out with your current position. Thanks for uh, spending your Thursday night with us, folks, and hopefully we talk to you guys soon.